All right, hey y'all, we need a status check here. Let us know how the signal is. Is the audio video good, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Uh, we didn't move locations. We have a couple buildings around us, so we need to confirm that we still have signal. Five by five. Okie dokie. Yeah, and if we could, if we could kind of keep the area behind us clear. Thanks. All right. Five by five. There we go. Okay. Good deal. So y'all, uh, you're live on Twitch right now. Tell us about what we've got in this Pelican case right. back here. So we are at uh, Spaceport America. We're the payload judges and we're here to judge Team 91, Clark College from Vancouver. And uh, this is your out brief of your mission. So go ahead and tell us what you've got and your results. Okay, um, my name is Michael Herline. I'm a uh, mechanical engineering student with a machining and CAD background. Um, the, uh, uh, I set out to uh, develop a team um, of several students uh, to develop a uh, development platform, uh, kind of a proof of concept. Um, it's, a, it, it's a hypothetical or a, a virtual mission. Um, the, the goal is to develop a something that could be an orbital platform uh, that would deorbit either known or uh, some kind of space debris or uh, satellites that have lost their orientation. So for folks who don't know what you're holding in your hand, describe to what that is. Uh, so this is a 3U CubeSat. It's in the, uh, uh, it's accurate to the tolerance, uh, dimensional tolerance standards of CubeSats. Um, it's 10 by 10 by 30 centimeters. Um, I've machined the entire case uh, myself. Um, it's well within the tolerances of dimensional standards. Um, the uh, um, it's uh, a full functional CubeSat. Uh, minimum weight is four kilograms. Um, the uh, it does several different operations on board. Um, it is uh, very tightly packed, uh, as you can see. Your um, solar panels, you've got four that deploy? Yes, so these are four uh, solar panels on spring hinges mm -hmm. um, that will uh, leave um, about half a millimeter of uh, clearance between the top rail and the bottom rail. Um, so that this slides nice and easy into the uh, payload enclosure that we have. And then when this deploys, then the four spring hinges will deploy. Um, they were, uh, if gravity was not weighing them down, then you can see that in the side position, um, but they're getting a little saggy right now. But um, the, uh, uh, so the solar panels uh, provide about 27 volts uh, to the system. Um, the, uh, there are two, uh, there, there's a orientation control uh, attitude adjustment um, system that is uh, comprised of three reaction wheels um, that is uh, uh, that uses encoded um, uh, DC motors um, as well as a uh, up in the top bolt plate here there are four solar sensors um, and the student who developed the uh, control algorithm, um, use these four photocells as a solar tracker so that we can maximize solar efficiency of the uh, so charging system. The fact that you've got solar trackers on there, you've got reaction wheels, this is nearly ready to fly in space. Mm -hmm. So you did a terrestrial test. Tell us about your data and what you've been able to, to learn from that. Um, the, um, uh, we have... Sorry, um, the, uh, we've had uh, many um, uh, testing in the prototype stage, um, and uh, the sun trackers work well, um, and found some bugs in the code, um, and uh, we can provide all the different the code that uh, we used, um, and uh, the uh, we also, in order to meet the minimum. Uh, mass requirements for the competition. Um, it's uh, three three kilograms of functional payload, and so um, it's very difficult to come up with that much <laughs> amount of mass and keep it functional. Exactly right. Uh, uh, 
there had been ideas of machining the case out of steel. Uh, I've never heard of a satellite machined out of steel, so that doesn't that didn't sit well with me. So what kind and of so, sensors? What kind of sensors do you have on board? Um, so we have let's see, uh, we have a Adafruit, Adafruit you know, 055, which is a yep. nine degree of freedom IMU uh, inertial inertial measurement unit. Uh, that will provide uh, 3D flight trajectory of the rocket um, or of the CubeSat itself. Um, so is that your ADCS, attitude control system? Um, in future iterations, yes. Okay. Um, the, uh, we also have um, our, our main flight computer for our launch vehicle uh, has a, is a Altus Metrum telemetrum, uh, and that sends GPS data uh, wanted to include uh, redundant backup GPS data so that we would always have a lock. Um, we also have um, a high accuracy temperature sensor inside the payload um, and a Bluetooth module that's receiving Bluetooth transmissions from the avionics bay where also another high temperature, uh, high accuracy temperature sensors down there. Um, the reason why we did that is we've had previous years where we had overheating issues of our altimeters and had total loss of the airframe. And so we wanted to have a ground station that had real time uh, data coming in so that if we had any kind of problems with temperature, we, we could go uh, assess the situation. So, so talk to us about the ground station. So once this is deployed and out, what data are you receiving into this? Because this is uh, military grade hardened setup that we would use in the military. So tell us a little bit about this. Um, the, uh, the, the structure itself, um, uh, we uh, we collaborated with our uh, our partner team uh, mm -hmm. out of Park Aerospace, which mm -hmm. is uh, drone competitions. Yep. And so we have three uh, a total of three of these um, identical systems built. Uh, one of them are, is for us, and then they need to for the drone operations. And so we uh, we collaborated with what we needed in the field as well as what they needed in the field. So, what kind of data is being recorded in here or downloaded? Um, I'll uh, have to pass that off to you. All right, uh, data Malcolm. man, tell yeah. me about your data, because <laughs> right. that's where all the money is. Um, so <laughs> my name is Malcolm Anderson. Uh, I'm a, a computer science student at, uh, at Clark College. Oop, just went off. Um, Perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you step there up go. there, that okay. thing goes to sleep. We're back. There you we're go. back. Perfect. So um, I developed this ground station software here on the right side uh, in order to receive information from the payload. Okay. Um, we've got a lot of, of sensors in the payload that are supposed to be uh, sending information back, including uh, location, latitude, and longitude, altitude, uh, temperatures of the, the payload and avionics, um, the rotation and everything. So we've got a lot of data, but we wanted to make it very easy to look at. You know, kind of so like also accelerometers? Uh, yeah, we've, we've got okay. uh, accelerometer and everything. Okay. So um, yeah, on the right side here, we've got kind of raw data. If I can, there's my mouse. Um, so we've got kind of raw data. We can see the latitude, longitude, altitude, uh, temperatures. Uh, we've also got te uh, temperatures for each of the components. Let's scroll back up here for payload bay and avionics. Uh, it's yep. not tra uh, transmitting right now, unfortunately. Um, but then, uh, in addition, we also have this kind of 3D view here. Mm -hmm. uh, so this 3D model of the rocket uh, will actually rotate to match the orientation of the CubeSat when it's uh, when it's transmitting, based on quaternion accelerometer data that we're getting. Um, each of these kind of colored bands on the rocket also represent a, a portion of the rocket that we're recording the temperature of, okay. so that we can see, you know, instead of having to switch between these tabs and look at this, mm -hmm. we can simply look at this model of the rocket, and if this part here is bright red, we say, oh, that's overheating, we need to take care of that. Mm -hmm. um, it's like so Kerbal. It, um, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never played it, I've heard that's it's very awesome, popular. Though. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so like if it's, if it's bright green, that would mean we're in a, in a really good temperature zone. Um, we've also got this map here. Uh, we collaborated with a, a company called Mapbox mm -hmm. to uh, bring these offline maps here uh, so that the latitude and longitude, when they send correctly, um, they will the rocket will position itself on the map where the latitude and longitude are. Um, so we can kind of roughly see That's where... That's kind of an accurate view. Yeah, ho hopefully pretty accurate. Um, we can see kind of the environment around us and if the rocket is currently like directly over the ground station, okay. since it hasn't gotten valid data yet, um, but if it wasn't, there would be an icon for the ground station. We also have an overhead view here, 
so that we could see from the ground uh, the ground station icon behind there where the rocket is um, and figure that out. So um, if your CubeSat was to deploy and separate from the rocket, are you going to be able to track both and would that appear on here? Um, I. Would, not, okay, not, I think I think this would be specifically tracking the cube set. But we would um, have the gotcha. data. Yeah, we yeah, would have the, have the data, so you yeah, definitely could. Yes. The reason for the d dual monitors is that uh, the Altus Metrum has its own uh, Got it. graphical user interface, so that we could display Perfect. both uh, launch vehicle and uh -huh. payload operations. Uh -huh. It also looks awesome. Oh, that's right. <laughs> the entire you. Pelican case filled with monitors. <laughs> Um, so I also I added this uh, thing I called the timeline. Uh, it's a very descriptive name. So uh, once we once the rocket is ready to launch, we yep. have a uh, a button here to start a countdown. Um, and once I press this, I'm not I'm not going to. It's going to mess up some other stuff. But um, once I once I or if I press this, it would start a countdown and then start to count up. Yep, work through and, algorithms. Um, yeah, and so okay. this uh, these bars would then start to fill up. So we know we calculated we would hit apogee around 30 seconds and we would land around three minutes 45 seconds. Uh, and so we would be able to see roughly where the rocket should be in its journey. So um, what was your goal altitude for this particular launch? Uh, about 10,000. 10,000? And did you meet that? What are your specs? Um, no. So, um, so we're not talking about that part. We're just talking yeah. about the payload of the ground station. <laughs> so, yeah. A different department. Yeah. Um, <laughs> story. And then we've also got here, uh, hopefully it will work, um, we've rec apparently, apparently recorded some new data, but we've also got a replay feature uh, so okay. that we, we've fed in some kind of test data so that you can just see it working. Um, so you can see here, this is just playing from a comma separated values file okay. we created, yep. but uh, you can see latitude, longitude, and altitude are all changing, we've got temperatures, um, the, rock, the orientation of the rocket is changing according to the quaternion values we're putting in. Um, and the temperature bands are changing. So color. what's approximate sampling rates on this? So once it goes up... So uh, what we found the best uh, was about a second to like three quarters of a second. Okay. Uh, otherwise the stuff would start to melt together. Okay. Um, however, we when we're... Half a second. Yeah, yeah. All, half okay. a second it would start to be kind of iffy. Um, however, when we're replaying data back, because we're not waiting for the next piece of data, we right. can interpolate. You can interpolate between... Yeah, so this is, you know, this, this is interpolating between like one second increments, but okay. it looks really nice and smooth. And then we'll also hear the timeline. Okay. So where do you guys see you going next year for the Clark? Because this is darn impressive. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah. um, tell me what you want to achieve next year. We just got a new space. I hope to get like a bunch of new people in from all sorts of different backgrounds uh -huh. so yeah. we can get as much manpower as we can. Uh, yeah, if we were just be air barely able to scratch this by, imagine what we could do with more people. We could do this and some. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Fantastic. Um, and I suppose I do have one other little thing to show off uh, kind of related to this. Is that okay? We like that. Yes. All right. Um, so in addition to this program, I also, uh, one of the things we talked about was how important it is to go out and recover the rocket. Mm -hmm. And that I've heard it's oftentimes a very grueling process because you, you have a very vague idea of where it is and go out into the desert. Um, so I had actually, for a, before I joined Clark Aerospace, I had been working on a program to identify landmarks uh, kind of via augmented reality. Um, and so <laughs> while this doesn't use augmented reality, I modified my program. And so what, we, what it does is it uses a phone's uh, GPS and compass data, okay. and along with some some math, some so you can map. just hand walk through the yeah. desert. And yeah, so I can simply, right out. I can simply if I go here, I've got ground approximate ground station coordinates. So I can type in latitude is about thirty two point nine five five. I can say the longitude is negative one zero six point nine three nine nine three nine, and say confirm. And then it will say that those coordinates, yep. according to my phone, are about that way, 1.46 miles. So you guys should probably show this to the recovery team folks, because they would okay. love to use this application <laughs> for basically all of the safety here at Spaceport. Mm -hmm. So that's very cool. Thanks. Congratulations. You guys have any questions for anybody in this crowd? Do you want to do the live, the live data? Well, we were going to, but right now. Uh, it looks like codes are yeah, running. It's yeah. running yeah. like the, the, the GPS might be having yeah, trouble. There was uh, uh, actually it's one more interesting thing. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. uh, when I was... Uh, it's hypothetical, yeah. The way I, uh, that I designed it mechanically is to 
develop it as light, light as possible, as least mass. And so, um, in order to meet the four kilogram mass, um, I had to start getting a little creative for that uh, one kilogram of non-functional. And so, the, uh, the there's an onboard nitrogen um, cold gas thruster system uh, built into the core, and the uh, and actually that um, allows the center of mass to be uh, within. Um, quarter of a millimeter of dead center. So you have a full um, gas tank in the center of that? Is yeah, that what so, that is? Okay. So this right here, yep, yep. Um, and then this is the nitrogen regulator, stainless steel nitrogen ah. regulator. And so the, uh, um, and there's a series of small solenoid valves, including the one that would be the deorbiter one. So, so how many different um, valves do you have? Do you have one on each uh, side? Have we, one we currently have uh, two, um, but the, uh, Needed uh, need to change um, uh, the placement of a few things around in order to fit. So have more. you tested that um, system in a free drop sort of uh, environment in your lab? Uh, no, we we don't really have the space to do that. Okay, um, that's, that's that's impressive. Setup. That's you know we've um, seen a couple teams do cold gas for stabilization and rotational and. Uh, they work quite well. That's definitely one thing we'll, we're going to continue into yeah. next year. Um, yeah, the hard part is the orientation and figuring out what the orientation is to allow your cool gas to fire in the appropriate times, angles, and all that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a hard problem. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so the uh, um, concerning with uh, high temperatures, uh, the the tank is inert um, right now, and. Uh, uh, in order to find a space, because this this is a very tightly packed Tetris game, um, the uh, the nitrogen cartridge is actually full of tungsten carbide and mill chunks, uh, and then filled the rest of the way with BBs, and that's our one kilogram of non-functional mass. Um, the uh, so you got one more kilogram to work with next year. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, the uh, so um, yeah, and as well as the. Uh, in order to deorbit de the known target that we're uh, trying to deorbit, um, uh, Kears uh, has developed a TensorFlow um, uh, camera ob object recognition platform uh, that will be uh, uh, located down in the bottom here. And so when the uh, CubeSat is orbiting, um, it's able to. Where'd my old CubeSat go? Oh, it's right there. Behind it. Oh. Um, so this is our CubeSat from the 2017 year, um, and this is the object that is, uh, for this is supposed to deorbit. De so, RPO, so, rendezvous proximity operations is a hot topic these days <laughs> in the commercial world as well as uh, the military world, so yeah. that's impressive. And that's, that's something that we talked about with some other teams this week mm -hmm. about hard problems that need to be solved, and uh, if you can work on that, that would be quite impressive. Yeah, and actually, uh, Kears, uh, you, you have a demonstration for this. So we're gonna, we're gonna, I think we're gonna need to cut off, it sounds like we're going to hybrid here shortly. Okay. Uh, so, um, do we have time for just one more? Let's I do, it. I can run out there Let's and get the rocket it. launch. Yeah. Let's go for it, I wanna hear the RPO yeah. work. And yeah, there's so. a bunch of questions in Twitch chat as well, uh, so <laughs> if oh, you're man. ready for some of those, we can ask some too. Well, this will be booting for a few seconds, so you can probably ask one or two. One or two? Um, so when you said it was a Tetris design to fit all that gear in there, <laughs> did you hum the Tetris song while you built the gear? <laughs> <laughs> no, because the camera gear, I have to fit all this camera gear into a case, and I'm like, doo, 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 doo. yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there you go. Is it booted? Yes. That was a short question. So <laughs> we'll see. So this is a hypothetical. Wow. And it's an object detection model, so it uses a machine learning model too. Can you rotate that towards me some? Yes. And it's not a very bright screen, so I apologize for. So there you are. And as you can see, this is our old payload. And even in these lighting conditions, which it wasn't really trained to, wasn't really accustomed to, it can it does a fair job detecting this old payload. And you can see it draws a bounding box around it, and this number above it is the the certainty of the model, this machine learning model, that it that the object that it's bounding is the object that we're looking for. Nice. So I used a Google released my machine learning API called TensorFlow, and they have like an object detection subset of that that you can use to train what are called models that are designed. You, you feed them a bunch of data, annotated data, like images of this thing, and you tell them where it is in this in each image, and it'll analyze the the data set and look for patterns, recognize patterns between them, and extrapolate 
so that you can feed it completely new images like these and it will recognize it in these images. So with this, you can see it's not a perfect model. Sometimes it doesn't detect the payload when it's supposed to or it detects incorrectly. It'll, it'll uh, falsely identify other things. But with this kind of stuff, really the sky is the limit because the only thing that holds these sort of models back is comp computational power, time, and amount of data. The more data you have, the and the longer you let it train, and the faster the computers get, the better it'll be. So for now, we have a pretty simple demo, but in the future, if we could build a better model that would detect it better and be a lot faster, as you can see, the frame rate's not very good, we could deploy this in an actual use case and have real orientation and tracking and deorbiting in the future. Nice. That's uh, pretty impressive. You guys are on the cutting edge because that's um, that's something that we're working on right now at the government level. So <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to talk about all that work. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's impressive work. Thank you. Do you want to do some more questions? Are you good with your time? I'm great. All right, We're cool. All here. Um, so I'm going to clarify something for chat right quick. This is a CubeSat. This isn't a payload that's you would send up in your rocket. It doesn't have a parachute on it or anything, no. right? No. This is this is a CubeSat that's designed to actually go to orbit. Yes. 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 Okay. So just to clarify that with everybody, uh, everybody loves your briefcase battle station, and it's more of like a suitcase battle station. Yes. Um, check check that they, on the airplane. It, you did it? Yes. They like you check that on they the airplane? Through, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do they do they like? Uh, uh, easy I'm sure easy they setup. It. Really? Very easy setup, yeah. And it's just, I bet you there's a bunch of wiring and stuff underneath it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's just cool that you have the monitors built in, you just shut the whole thing and you're good to go. Um, somebody said they can't come up with any good questions because what do you ask a bunch of geniuses? <laughs> so you've got that going for you. Uh, somebody, I think these are the battery types you used, 18650s. Are those the batteries, or do you know what type of batteries those yeah, are? Yeah, they're uh, Panasonic NCR 1860DBs. Uh, they're <laughs> okay. a very uh, reliable um, lithium-ion cell. Uh, actually, the uh, Tesla Model S uh, uses them. Okay. Um, and uh, they're uh, uh, they're very stable. They have a very high um, capacity, yep. and uh, um, and they provide clean power to our system. Cool. They said, uh, did you choose them because of the weight? Is it like a charged away thing, or is it just reliability? Or it's yeah, it's it's reliability. Okay. Um, it's uh, we've been using them for a long time, so it's we uh, know they work. You trust them? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, and then could you show us the cold gas system a little bit better? Just if you just point it at me, so I can see it, and then don't move it much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be hard to see it back in there, but yeah. so the regulator is um, up in this section. Okay, um, and that just shows the pressure, the, the pressure that's in there right now? Yeah, uh, uh, tungsten carbide. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> and then the tank, if you send it to the bottom, can we see the tank up the bottom there? Yeah. Is that the tank? Yeah. So. All right, let me see if I can get that. There you go. So how big is the tank? How much volume? What does it hold? Do you know? Um, let's see. That's an 18 gram uh, nitrogen. Uh, cartridge. Uh, it's 2,700 psi nitrogen, um, and so the uh, we didn't. Uh, that's absolute tank pressure. Um, and then the uh, gauge that we have, the uh, regulator, uh, will um, reduce that down to five to ten gauge pressure. Right. Uh, psi. And you uh, tell how we made weight too. Yeah, yeah, I just did. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it's uh, a, a, a another uh, faculty member um, donated. Uh, uh, some end mills uh, to our program, and uh, they're diamond coated tungsten carbide, uh, and they uh, that was the heaviest uh, uh, objects that we could get our hands on. At the yeah. Time, so, um, and so you put those in there just to increase the mass of the paint, or what is? Yeah. And so I, I we we designed this to be uh, as low mass as possible. Okay. Um, and th that's, uh, from my understanding, uh, to design a satellite you want to weigh. You want to maximize the payload that yeah. you can carry. We're not and like so tossing a bunch of extra bolts and nuts the, in there just to make it yeah, heavy, the, right? The frame itself um, is designed to be stru uh, structural as well as uh, low low mass as possible. Gotcha. That's cool. So, so just to sort of clarify for Twitch chat, um, there's there's like a mass limit or a mass target or something when mm -hmm. you build this for the competition. Yes. And you have to sort of get it to that mass, or it doesn't mm -hmm. qualify. Did I get that right? Or it, yeah, it's it, it requires to be three kilograms of functional mass. Three kilograms uh, of functional mass. Four and then four kilograms minimum. Gotcha. That has to do with the rocket 
competition because less mass will fly different. Right. So if you were like if you were designing the satellite, you have some stuff there that you might not need for it, but for the purposes of the judging and the competition, you added some extra stuff in specifically exactly. for that. Because yeah. that sort of follows up another question, right? Um, why did you bother bringing the CubeSat if it's designed to go to space? Because we're not launching orbital rockets here. Sort of a smart aleck question, and I'll, I'll ban them if you need me to. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I'm on my phone all, right now. All questions welcome. All questions welcome. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so in the payload challenge, this is exactly the kind of thing that we want to see. So we do terrestrial flights, we do airdrops of systems like this before we fly in space. We fly things like this on UAVs at high altitude to test them first before we fly them. So this is a perfect example of the kind of payload for the Space Dynamics Lab payload challenge that we're looking for. And some teams do actually put these on a parachute. And you know, you surely don't want to fly something that they put this much time in and put it on a parachute and drop it down. But that's a test. That's yeah. a test and an evaluation of it. So that's kind of why. And so, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. And there's all sorts of stuff like before you put it on a full rocket, you need to make sure that it can withstand the acceleration and the forces that it reaches. And you don't necessarily need to go all the way to space for those initial sorts of tests. Right? That's right. There's a, there's multiple steps to do the space hardening of something like this. And uh, you know, they're they're five steps down the path of 10 steps. And, and that's you know, and other impressive. Than, other than the components that we uh, purchased, uh, everything is made in-house. It's the <laughs> entire case and structure is machined uh, by myself in the machine shop at Clark. Um, the, all of the mounts for the motors and uh, the different control boards are all uh, SLA uh, printed on our Formlabs Form 2 printer. Nice. Uh, and so, uh, this, this is the prototype. This has a lot of hours into it, but um, I have all of the uh, uh, toolpath CNC files in order to machine the very, very accurate parts out again. Um, it's actually uh, 20 microns off from 10 centimeters wow. in both directions. Um, the, uh, and, um, and so we could, we could e very easily uh, duplicate this over and over again if need be. Um, so there's another question about, and I can keep asking questions all day. There's, I wasn't going to tell you all, there's like 300 people watching this right now. Oh, wow. So uh, there's lots of people asking questions. Can you demonstrate the solar panel deployment again so we yes. can get that sort of up close? So, um, we actually, uh, um, in a future, okay, uh, future uh, development, um, we, we, we wanted to uh, develop uh, hinges or closures for it. Right. Um, but uh, as of right now, it's um, in uh, this state where, uh, as it slides into the payload bay, it'll the payload uh, sleeve will hold the panel shut. Um, and um, and technically, if you're deploying it off of a launcher, um, all you need to have is the panels to open once. Right. Um, and so the. Uh, um, Straight the, up spring loaded. Yes, uh, they're actually torsion springs. Um, and uh, you can, let's see. Yeah, I'm pretty good at zooming in if you just, uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. And so um, the uh, solar panels are all wired in series, so we're getting actually about 27 volts um, out of the system. And uh, the, uh, there's, yeah, four uh, torsion springs uh, that were calcu uh, calculated in order to hold these panels and these hinges. Um, and the reason why they're sagging down a little bit is gravity's Gravity, holding them down yeah. a little bit. And so um, we designed it so that it would flur out and um, die in its intended uh, destination. Um, and uh, yeah. Cool. It's, um, so there's no other sort of like a retention system that keeps them closed. It's literally just the sleeve. Well, it's, it's the spring itself. The uh, spring itself? In, in its, uh, Deployed by stage? by its design, it's gotcha. uh, uh, 180 degrees uh, torsion spring. So, gotcha. um, in their relaxed state, they're in this position. And then, I when think. they're closed down, there's not like a clamp or anything on the cube set that holds them. Is it just no. a sleeve? Uh, it, 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 we we wanted to develop some kind of a uh, servo control uh, that would uh, automatically flip them out with right. our ground station. But um, it's uh, you have to pick your priorities, sure. and uh, it's That's next year. yeah, That's next that would year. be next year. <laughs> That's the best thing because every year there's like, oh, we can improve this, we can improve this. Yeah, and I think for a lot of the university students, you run out of time, you have to go find a job and graduate, right? Mm -hmm. So. That's really cool. Um, you said there were reaction wheels on it. Yeah. So, um, a one of the students uh, developed the uh, 
uh, orientation control system. Um, it's uh, in this current state. It uh, would uh, um, track the position of the sun. Um, the uh, um, the wheels aren't very big because right. we're not um, testing them down here. Um, and uh, I I set out to machine aluminum ones uh, with uh, SLA printed hubs, but um, with time manage uh, with time deadlines. Um, there were much more sure. important uh, objectives. Yeah, I gotcha. And so the, uh, the the wheels are actually uh, SLA printed, um, and uh, we have three uh, encoded DC uh, um, brushed motors, and those are powered powered by um, or controlled by make lock um, high powered uh, encoder motor drivers. Cool. Um, it, and and that's also uh, all Arduino controlled. Um, all on board. Yes. Yeah. Well, okay. So for for people who are in Twitch chat and don't know what a reaction wheel is, uh, if you're sitting in an office chair right now that swivels, stick your elbows out to the side and like do the twist, like move your elbows back and forth. And what you're doing is is you're trying to create like a rotational force by moving one mass in one direction, and your body forward, goes yeah. in the other direction, right? Yeah. So you can actually be a reaction wheel sitting in your spinny office chair just by putting your elbows out and like moving them back and forth. And it's the same concept here. You spin up the wheel in one direction, and that's going to exert an opposite force on the satellite, moving it in the other direction. You put a couple of reaction wheels in there, aligned on different axes, and you can. You have three, right? Yes. So um, you can uh, orient it in three different axes using the reaction wheels by yeah. speeding them up or slowing them down. And and it, the the difficult thing when you actually do get to space is to how to slow the wheels down without yep. uh, changing your position. And so the uh, um, future iterations, we could explore different ideas and that's one of the reasons something. why we had a uh, cold gas thruster system exactly. where we could use um, some kind of thrust in order to um, slow the wheels down to a stop. So it's the same sort of thing that the huge International Space Station does. They have the big control moment gyros on board and they have to desaturate them, spin them down sometimes and they use thrusters to maintain position while they take the energy up. That's awesome. Um, so a lot of people say you should give a shout out to your teachers. Yeah. <laughs> are they here? Yeah. Are there teachers well, um, around right now? He's hiding. He's uh, hiding. Why are you hiding? <laughs> we wouldn't be at this uh, competition uh, without T. Stansbury. Um, and he's the one who Hello. really uh, got no, us into You can't uh, duck away from the camera. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our... Uh, this is our fourth? Third year at Ezra? Fourth year at Ezra? Fourth year at Ezra. Fourth, fourth year at Ezra. Um, and... Uh, the uh, and before that we did the NASA student launch competitions. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, we have a great faculty at Clark College, uh, including uh, Pat Sevier, uh, our machining uh, CNC machine instructor, um, and uh, uh, Keith Stansberry, and um, the engineering faculty, uh, and it's. Um, but in the end, it's yeah. about the students, and they did all the work, <laughs> and. Uh, I just I'm in tears at uh, how how wonderful these students have done. It's it, it's truly special. Thank you. Absolutely. Everybody thinks that your work is amazing. The stuff that you built um, is absolutely mind. I mean, mind blowing for us, right? We see this stuff and we love to understand how it works. But I I can't fathom how I would put something like that together. So you have this awesome team of people here that sort of nope, I'm going. Uh, <laughs> that sort of work together to to create something like that. It's really awesome that y'all were able to build that and bring it out here to the harsh environment of the desert and show it off. I mean, that's why we have the ballistic case, right? Look at this. <laughs> and it's fantastic. Dual, and dual fans. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. So uh, there's all sorts of other questions. I'm not going to take up any more of your time. We're going to go get set up over here. Do you all have a social media account on Twitter or Facebook where people might be able to ask you some more questions? Um, yes, uh, we do. Who's in uh, charge of that? Do we have a social media coordinator all of a sudden? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, this oh, look. Yeah. Hey, look at this guy. This is the social yeah, media yeah. coordinator. <laughs> First name is Hollywood. Crazy, we'll, have a, we'll have a social media coordinator uh, next year. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have one. We have a page, right? What's they do have a hashtag. We have, we have Clark Aerospace on Facebook, Clark Aerospace on Instagram. We also have uh, ClarkAerospace.com where you can contact us through. And we also have an email, ClarkAerospace1 at gmail.com. You can send us emails um, and questions directly if you like any. Please don't sign him up for cat facts. <laughs> Folks. Number one or the word one? Number one. Number, Number one. one. Okay. 
Cool, so Twitch chat, if you're looking for more, uh, thank you for coordinating that social media presence. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> if, you're, if you're looking for more information or you have questions or anything like that, uh, they are busy out here. We're gonna let them get packed up and stuff. And we need to get back over because the hybrid range, 15 minutes, they said. So that's like 45 minutes of hybrid <laughs> minutes. Um, yeah. We're gonna go get set up to see if we can catch some hybrid launch. Y'all, thank you so much. Definitely. Everybody thank is you. so impressed with your work. This is really awesome. Uh, Twitch chat, y'all know what to do. We'll cut them loose, show them some love. And uh, when we come back, we will be back out on the range waiting for the hybrids to go chat. So thank y'all so much. And then we awkwardly count to seven before we go to commercial, which basically is just me asking people to play for my plane tickets. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's cut it off.